I'm extremely grateful for um, our school board, um, for their courage, uh, for their vision and tenacity uh, in making sure that we all stay focused on the mission of this um, school system. So I thank the school board uh, for the opportunity to continue to serve um, our community and our amazing um, children in Broward County. In about two weeks, uh, Broward County Public Schools will start the new school year. It's always been a great day of appreciation. It's been a day of excitement as teachers and educational support professionals and principals and administrators, bus drivers, food service workers, every one of our 30,000 employees welcome back almost 270,000 of our precious children into our classrooms, providing valuable learning opportunities for our kids, offering engaging experiences through sports, the arts, peer mentoring, showcasing their talents in musicals, speech and debate competitions, and watching our students excel in the classroom and on the athletic field. That's what we live for. But the coronavirus epidemic has changed all of that. First, some context. Our schools reflect the structural and societal challenges that we struggle with in this nation. There are five areas that stand out in this crisis. Food insecurity, the digital divide, access to quality child care, housing instability, and our fragile health care system. You know, one in seven, or about 12 million children in the United States struggle with food insecurity and hunger. These are symptoms of a larger societal issues around poverty and inequality. 65% of the children attending Broward County Public Schools qualify for free or reduced meals. For many children, our public schools are the only reliable place for them to receive two nutritious meals, breakfast and lunch, each day. On March 13th, when we announced the closing of our school campuses, we felt an immediate moral obligation and responsibility to put several things in place. Our schools became the lifeline for so many in our community. We continue to distribute food from our local school sites and have served over two and a half million meals to students and families since mid-March. I am proud of what we've done to address the digital divide and digital inequities by distributing more than 100,000 laptop computers to any student who needs one, offering discounted internet services to families, and free mobile hotspots to students with housing instability. Through our home library initiative for our pre-K through second grade students, we distributed 48,000 book packs, where each book pack included five books, a family guide, and a student journal. That's 240,000 books that we delivered to the homes of our students and families in May and June. District mental health staff have continued to provide services to students. Since March 30th, our family counseling program therapists provided over 4,300 hours of therapy via telehealth. And our amazing social workers received over 34,000 referrals and provided almost 160,000 interventions. That is some amazing work that needs to be recognized. In a survey completed a few weeks ago, 32% of our families told us that they want to continue e-learning. E-learning is what we call online distance learning here in Broward. Those 32% wanted to continue that in the fall. 36% said they wanted a blended uh, e-learning model where there would be face-to-face -face education. And 30% told us that they want 100% face-to-face so that they can get back to normal. 
The fact is, we would all like to get back to normal because we know that the best place for our children is back in our schools. But for now, normal has to be within the context of COVID-19. A big consideration here in South Florida about how and when we open schools is the state of the pandemic. Unfortunately, South Florida continues to be a hotspot for coronavirus spread in this country. As of last week, Florida reported more than 480,000 known cases of the coronavirus, with the highest concentration here in Broward and Miami-Dade counties, where the positivity rate has at times been as high as 20%. Florida has chosen to be a better place and to try to continue to address this. But we're still struggling. Florida has close to 7,000 deaths and has been breaking records for the most new coronavirus cases daily. Within our own school district, even with schools being closed and only skeletal crews on campus, we've recorded more than 200 positive cases among employees. And recently, the Florida chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics wrote a letter to the governor which included the following statement. Science should drive decision making on safely reopening schools. Public health agencies must make recommendations based on evidence, not politics. Currently, viral and infection rates in Florida are extremely high, with a rolling average of 14.2% of tests positive for new infections over the past two weeks. Public health experts and infectious disease physicians almost universally recommend that children not go to school until the positive test rate is in the range of three to five percent over a rolling two-week average. If children go to school with such high infection rates, schools will be forced to close very quickly after opening, and many children and families will likely become ill with COVID-19. We agree with these recommendations. Our local test positivity rate is still averaging around 13 to 15 percent, which is almost three to five times the recommended range to consider when reopening schools. As we continue to consult and consult with our local public health officials and medical experts for guidance, I have been clear about reopening schools we will not compromise the health and safety of our students, teachers, and staff. That's our highest priority, period. One of our amazing third grade students, Ethan Jolly, made the case last week when he said, our teachers are superheroes, but they cannot fight coronavirus. When we open schools in the fall, our only option is with e-learning and a full e-learning model. That is the only way we can educate our students while keeping them, their teachers, and employees healthy and safe. We simply cannot risk exposing our students and the staff until the coronavirus is under control. And when conditions improve, and we hope that it will not be into the far distant future, Additional options will be introduced. We'll have face-to-face -face learning five days per week. We'll also offer a hybrid or blended model with staggered school days with part-time on campus and part-time e-learning connected to your neighborhood school. And we'll also offer continued e-learning connected to the student's home school. We may have been the first large district in the country to announce that it is opening using distance learning. Since that time, we've seen many other districts that were planning to reopen their classrooms have abandoned those plans. Our commitment is to deliver high quality instruction to our students 
regardless of which learning model we provide. Specifically to e-learning, we're using the experience and lessons learned during the last three months of the school year to significantly enhance the quality of e-learning. We are committed to improving the e-learning experience this fall. To deliver on this goal, there are several things we are doing differently. Our teachers have been receiving additional training on the tools and strategies they need to be the most effective in engaging our students. Teachers will be doing live video instruction and face-to-face -face support during class. At the elementary school level, grades K through five, our schools will offer evening sessions based on parent demand for this flexibility at their local school. At the secondary level, we will provide a district-wide academic support model with certified teachers who will provide live instructional support or office hours for students who need it in core academic areas. At the same time, we will maintain our commitment to provide laptop computers to students who need them and to negotiate free or low-cost internet connectivity through Comcast and AT&T, including free mobile hotspots. Addressing student access will be an ongoing priority for us. We understand that distance learning or e-learning will never, it will never be a substitute for face-to-face -face teaching. And we must also understand that at this time, our students, they will continue to learn and we will work to make the e-learning environment personal. We're gonna to work to make sure that it's engaging, it's interesting, it's challenging, and it's fulfilling. I will continue to ask you, our community, for help. The only way our district will be able to open our school buildings is when the community has lowered the number of COVID-19 cases. It will require each and every one of us collective sacrifice to contain community spread of COVID-19 by wearing masks, by physical distancing, and by washing hands. Otherwise, like other schools and camps we've seen in the news lately, we may open and then we may have to close if there are outbreaks and the community infection rate continues to climb. We must recognize that we are all in this together. All of our actions and behaviors, they're interconnected. And together, during this most challenging time, we must set an example for our kids and for each other. Together, we can do this. Sisi Puede, Winu Kapab, I ask our leaders to put in place national and state plans that include effective testing and contact tracing. We ask that everyone fight for our children by advocating for our federal government to pass a coronavirus relief package which responds to the impact of COVID-19 and will assist with recovery and provide at least 200 billion to public schools across this country that serve over 50 million students. This funding is critically needed to cover the impending substantial shortfall in state and local revenue collections, to continue to feed students and families, to close gaps in remote learning, to expand mental health services, to provide reliable high-speed internet access for all students, and to purchase necessary PPE materials and equipment for enhanced cleaning and sanitation protocols to make our schools safe for our students, teachers, and staff when schools open. The past several months have been a real awakening on many fronts. We've awakened to the persistent threat and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the deadly consequences of what happens 
when we put politics and ideology over science. We've awakened to our country's institutionalized racism and injustice that has been sparked by the murder of George Floyd. And parents and caregivers all across this country, they have awakened to how difficult and challenging the teaching profession can be and how essential our public schools are to the functioning of our economy. This moment has been intensely difficult for our parents and caregivers as they worry not only about their child's education and development, but also deal with job loss and instability, food insecurity, family and friends with health challenges, and a climate of fear and anxiety about what next week will bring. I continue to extend my gratitude to our parents and guardians for your patience and support as you navigate this uncharted journey with us. It has also been an enormously challenging time for our teachers, many of whom are also parents and are struggling. To each of our administrators, teachers, education support professionals, food service workers, facility service persons, and all staff, Thank you for your support. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your understanding and patience. And thank you for all your hard work, commitment, and dedication to our young people. You are the ones who help shape the lives of our students. Your work matters. Today, I ask everyone to give each other some grace and understanding in this unimaginable time. Let's provide each other with love and support while recognizing that everyone will have to make sacrifices so that we can get through this together. If we can do that, our children will be the beneficiaries of our collaboration. Let's stay focused on why we are here, our children. Our children have so many abilities and talents to develop, and so many dreams to live that are being stifled by this pandemic. We owe it to them and future generations to develop national and local strategies to get this pandemic under control so that we can fully open schools and provide them with the opportunities to thrive. I'll end with a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Don't go where the path may lead you. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. There is no playbook for this moment that we're in. But we do have the opportunity to blaze a trail that will help our students, our teachers, and the community recover from the challenges of COVID-19 and create a new and transformed public education system that will better prepare all of our students for a successful future. They deserve nothing less. Thank you, and let's have a great school year.